You know, I believe it's really important for us to learn how to take care of our bodies. Your body is very important, and if you wear out the one you've got, you can't go somewhere and buy another one. So you need to invest in yourself and take good care of yourself. So many people, they are sick, and you know, we have the option of praying and asking God to heal us, but I don't think it does much good to pray for healing if we're going to abuse ourselves at the same time. So this is just a loving encouragement for you to take care of yourself. And if you're doing things that are harmful to your own health, not getting enough sleep, eating junk food all the time, uh, not resting, it's good to make some spirit-led changes. So watch this teaching on healing, and then later in the program, I'll be talking about God's supernatural rest. I want to talk to you for a few minutes this morning about um, sickness and healing. Um, <laughs> you know, sadly, a lot of times people are not taught that healing of all kinds is part of the atonement. It's part of what Christ died for us to have. Why would he want us to be saved and feel bad all the time? And, I, you know, for a long time, I didn't know that I could ask God to heal me when I was sick. Matter of fact, sometimes we just kind of fall in love with our illnesses and we claim them as our own, you know. My arthritis, my aching back, you know, my blood pressure, my this and my that and my something else. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of different ways that God gets healing to us today. And, you know, I thank God for all the, the medical help that's available. But even that, I don't think that can even help us if we don't go to God first. So let me just, you know, respectfully say, if you're trusting the doctor and you're leaving God out of the loop, uh, yeah, <laughs> you, uh, you know, we, we need the medical professionals to have the wisdom that only God can give them. And, um, but I do thank God for it. I am going to pray for people this morning that have pain in your body or that are sick. But before I do, I'm going to give you a little motherly speech, okay? I'm old enough to be most of you, your mother. So we're just, I'm going to be motherly this morning. I'm going to talk to you like I would my kids. You need to take care of yourself. You need to stop staying up all night and not getting any sleep. You need to stop drinking six soda pops a day and drink more water. Amen. You need to stop eating sugar four times a day. You need to stop living on fast food that's full of chemicals and grease. And you need to de-stress your life and calm down. Now, you know, everybody today wants a miracle. <laughs> but to go with a miracle, you need some wisdom or you'll lose the miracle you got and get another problem. And most people today... Most being, I don't know what percentage that would be, but I think there's more people who don't take care of themselves than those who do. And we make all kinds of excuses, and, I, and, and a lot of it's I'm busy. I don't, I don't have time to fix good food, so I just grab whatever is on the run. I can't get seven or eight hours sleep a night. I don't have time. I'm too busy. I don't have time to exercise. I don't... I don't have time to rest. I got to keep going, keep going, keep going. But doing what? There's not a person in this room today that couldn't get a fair measure of the stress out of your life just by simply writing down everything it is that you think you have to do and eliminating the ones that aren't bearing any good fruit in your life. Let me say this lovingly. People will take advantage of you if you let them. And you can't blame them because we are the ones that have to protect our own lives. If you don't take care of you, who's going to? I'll say that again. If you don't take care of you, 
who's going to. I've decided that busy is the new four letter word. <laughs> well, I haven't heard from you in six months. Where have you been? Oh, I'm just busy. <laughs> just busy. Just busy. Well, you know what? God didn't call us to be busy, He called us to be fruitful, to bear good fruit, and to prune things out of our life. <laughs> You know, I hate sickness and disease and what it does to people. I hate it. You know, if you feel really bad, you don't even want to pray. And I don't think we should all be tired all the time. I think God created us to have energy. But I can tell you, if you don't sleep and you're constantly putting the wrong kind of stuff, what would happen to your automobile if you didn't put good fuel in it? Amen. So like I, I'm just being motherly this morning. If you don't, you know, if you don't want to hear it, stick your fingers in your ears. I'll be done in a minute. But, you know, you say, well, what's this got to do with church? I'll tell you the truth. It's got a whole lot to do with church. I'll tell you why. Because your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. God lives in you and he lives in you so he can work through you. But if you're too tired to move all the time, Amen. And I'm going to say the really dirty word right now, exercise. <laughs> People used to work hard enough they didn't have to go try to exercise. But now, man, we got it made. We got elevators and escalators and automatic dishwashers, and we crab about pushing the button and having to unload it. <laughs> okay, so... You heard my speech. Now, here's the thing. I believe that healing is part of the atonement. The Bible says we can pray the prayer of faith and the sick will be healed. But I don't really think that it's going to do me any good to pray for everybody if you're just going to keep abusing yourself. Are we all together on this page this morning? Has anybody been even a little bit convicted that maybe you need to make a few changes and how you're... All right. Well, good. That's what it's all about. I rarely ever read this scripture because people who don't really know the word could get a wrong idea, but here it goes. Acts 3, verse 1. Now, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour, three o'clock in the afternoon, when a certain man crippled from his birth was being carried along who was laid each day at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, so that he might beg for charitable gifts from those who entered the temple. So when he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he said, would you give me a gift? And now here's where it gets interesting. And Peter directed his gaze intently at him, and so did John, and said, look at us. Now, basically, what he's getting ready to say is, we've got what you need. You know why you've got what the world needs? Because you have the power of God in you. You have God's anointing in you, and you can pray for people. See, I told you, you're just like, you can pray for people and see the sick get well. Now, I know we're at a whole new gate for a lot of folks, and I understand that. You know, I was in a large denomination for a long, long time that didn't teach me anything about the miracle working power of God. I knew that God was powerful, but I didn't know that he wanted to share any of it with me. These guys were born again. They'd been there on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was poured out. And now they have the nerve to stand and say, you have a problem? Look at me. <laughs> You're still not with me, are you? Okay. <laughs> it's not anything you have in yourself. It's what God has given you. And, you know, there's a lot I don't understand about healing and, you know, why we pray for some people and they get healed and why we pray for others and they don't. And, but I do believe part of it has something to do with this whole thing about how people just disrespect their selves and their lives and the way people treat each other today and all the stress that's in the world. Amen? 
And this is not the answer. I mean, there's real disease. I mean, the devil's alive and well on planet Earth. And, you know, if you don't get what you ask for, then you trust God to take you through. And miracles and healings are different. You know, if we somebody gets a miracle, it's like, Whoa! but healings take time. And I believe sometimes you have to cooperate with those healings. And, you know, I'll be very honest with you. Years ago, I was almost finished from stress. And three times I made myself sick working in the ministry because I thought I had to do what everybody wanted me to do. I had to go where everybody wanted me to go. Well, Joyce, God told us you're supposed to come do our conference. So I brought them to the conference. And finally, I got smart enough to say, well, God didn't told me. And if he doesn't told me, then I'm not going. And you know, I hate it when people pull that God told me card. Somehow or another, that just puts like this. Well, if I don't do it, am I going to be missing God? <laughs> so anyway, long story short, after three go-arounds at getting sick, I finally wised up. And you know what? I asked God for healing, and I have it now, but it came over a, a long period of time and making a lot of changes in my life. Amen? I must be doing this for somebody because this was not my plan to get up here and go this long. So, Amen? And so all these things that I'm asking you to do, I do them. I maintain a regular bedtime. I go to bed early. I get up early. I love that quiet time in the morning before anybody else gets up. Some of you say, well, I just wish that I had some quiet, but I just, you know, there's just so much going on in my house, I just can't get it. Get up before they do. But then that means sometimes you've got to go to bed before they do. Amen? So I just want to tell you that I believe that you can experience the healing power of God in your life, and I don't care if you've prayed a thousand times before, we're going to pray today and we're going to believe God that every day you're going to get better and better in every way. Amen? Here we go. Let's all stand up and we're going to pray. So he looked at Peter and John and said, would you give me a gift? And they said, look at us. And there's an exclamation mark here, so I guess they yelled. I don't know. And the man paid attention to them, expecting that he was going to get something from them. But Peter said, silver and gold money I do not have, but what I do have that I give to you in the use of the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Walk. All right. So I, I love this. I mean, he didn't even really pray and ask God to do something. He commanded healing to come in the name of Jesus Christ. You know why? Because there's healing in that name. The name of Jesus is above every other name that at the name of Jesus, every knee must bow. Come on, I'm wanting you to get an attitude of, okay, I'm just not going to lay down and just put up with this anymore. I'm going to press in like the woman who had the issue of blood. I'm going to press through the crowd and I'm going to touch the hem of his garment and trust him for healing and wholeness. Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you for what Jesus did for us on the cross. And that by his stripes, we are healed and made whole. Healing is in us because Christ is in us. Healing is in the depths of our spirit. And Lord, effective today, we declare war on sickness and disease and pain, and we're not going to just invite it and put up with it and love it and claim it and name it. We're at least going to stand with you and say, we believe that you are our healer, and we thank you for healing us and for giving us the wisdom to value what you've created and to take care of ourselves 
And so in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I say, be healed and made whole in Jesus' name. Come on, give God a big praise. I feel better already. Well, I'm going to do a series this weekend that we're going to call um, Sit, Stand, Walk, and Run. You say, well, boy, that's an odd title. Well, the Bible says we're to be seated in Christ. We're to stand strong in God and stand against the enemy. We're to walk with God, walk in love, walk as Christ walked, and we're to run our race. However, I think a lot of people don't realize that standing, walking, and running all have to be done only after, all, all can be done only after you've learned how to sit. Because sit means to rest in God. It's amazing what a wonderful life that we can have when we can learn to do everything while we're resting in God, while we're trusting Him, while we're not trying to figure things out ourselves or make things happen ahead of God's timing. Amen? Does anybody know how frustrating that is, trying to make things happen ahead of God's timing? You know, I always say, let's enjoy the journey while we're on the way to where we're going. Enjoy where you're at on the way to where you're going. And I have to say that I didn't do that for a lot of the years of my life. I wanted my ministry to grow so bad that I was just miserable all the time trying to make it grow, and I really didn't enjoy where I was at. Well, I've learned now how to enjoy it. Resting in God is one of the most important things that we can learn how to do, because we're not going to enjoy anything Absolutely nothing if we don't know how to enter God's rest. And if you're smart, you can tell when you get out, and it's very easy to get back in. Tonight we're going to talk about, are you out? Are you in? If you're out, get back in. If you're in, stay there. Because we need to be in the rest of God. Now, Just a few scriptures first to lay a foundation here. First of all, Ephesians 1, 19 through 21. This was actually a message that God gave me probably, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago. And it came about as a result of me beginning to notice that most of the places where Jesus is talked about in the Bible after his death and resurrection, it always depicts him as seated and makes a pretty good point out of that. And in Ephesians 1, 19, it says, so that you can know and understand what is the immeasurable and unlimited and surpassing greatness of his power in and for us who believe as demonstrated in the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. He seated him now, you know, we can, this is one of the ways where we can read the Bible for years and years and years and never even notice some little thing like that, that he, he was seated. Let, let's look at Hebrews 1, 3. Now, this is a little bit long in the Amplified Bible, but it's good, so we'll just read it. He is the sole expression, he being Christ, of the glory of God, the light being the outrang or the radiance of the divine, and he is the perfect imprint and the very image of God's nature upholding and maintaining and guiding and propelling the universe by his mighty word of power. Well, that would preach right there, but we're not after that part, so we'll go on. When he had, now this is what we want to see, when he had by offering himself accomplished our cleansing of sins and the riddance of our guilt, he sat down at the right hand of the divine majesty on God. Everybody say he sat down. And then in verse 13, it says, besides to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand, associate with me in my royal dignity till I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. So am I understanding this right, that Jesus did everything that he was supposed to do, then he went and he just sat down and he's now waiting for God to do what only God can do which has put Satan in his final place of defeat. So what we need to learn is to do, the Bible says do all the crisis demands and then stand firmly in your place. It's not that we don't do anything. 
but everything we do must be done from a place of rest. Now, I'm sitting here physically, but the rest that we're talking about, if you study it in the original language, it's, it's not a rest from work, it's a rest in work. It's resting while we're doing everything that we're doing. You can parent your children while spiritually seated. You can pastor a church while spiritually seated. It doesn't mean that you don't do anything, but it means that you're not taking the burden of it. You're not taking the care of it. You're doing what you can do, what God has given you the grace to do, and you're doing it constantly with his help. But the part you can't do, you don't get upset about. You leave that in God's hands and in God's timing. I don't know about you, but I want to enjoy my life. Is anybody here want to enjoy life? Well, do you know sometimes, now be honest, sometimes in the pursuit of our dreams, we get so driven about getting what we think we want that we don't really enjoy the life that we have now. Amen? Let me just say it again. Sometimes in pursuit of our dreams, we get so driven to get this thing we want that we don't enjoy what we have right now. And I made that mistake. And so part of my whole ministry is to take the mistakes that I've had and the victories I've had and try to help people not to make so many turns around the mountain, but to maybe get there a little bit easier and enjoy your life a lot more. You see, I believe, and I can prove this scripturally, I think that it is tragic for Jesus to have done what he did, suffer like he did, paid the price for our sins, wants us to enjoy our life. John 10, 10, the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy Jesus. I can, he might have, and enjoy your life. Good news, God wants you to enjoy your life, and that doesn't mean you live on vacation, but it does mean that you can live with your soul on vacation. It does mean that your inner man can always be having a vacation, no matter what you happen to be doing on the outside. Come on, somebody give God praise. All right, Mike's going to come and help me, and I want to show you something. I thought about doing it for you myself, but I thought, no, nah, I'll take it easy tonight. Okay, Mike, be a baby. <laughs> now, see, we all start out, you know, babies, we just think that's cute. I mean, I got a little baby grandson now, and he's just like, ew. Well, we all start out as baby Christians. We're just not supposed to end up where we start out. Amen? And so, the next thing that a baby learns to do, and of course, they crawl and they turn over and stuff like that. But the next really major thing they learn to do is they learn how to sit. Okay, now, finally, and you know, it even takes a while to learn how to do that right, because sometimes you're like falling over, and you know, you got to catch yourself, and then they'll fall all the way over, and you know, come on, Mike, just fall all the way over there. Yeah. And then, you know, mama, in this case, Father God will come along and say, come on, sweetheart, you can get back up and get them back up. But everything is, is sitting, you know. And so then eventually they learn how to stand. And boy, that is big. And that's really wobbly for a long time. Like, you know, wobble, brother. <laughs> and then, you know, they fall down, they get up, they fall down, they get up. And then they finally start learning how to walk. But it's just one little tiny, tiny step. Lots of falling in all this, see? But, it, well, I'll go ahead and show you tonight, but I'll get into this more tomorrow. Fall down, Mike. <laughs> okay, now, now look. But God's got a plan. When you fall down, all you got to do is go back to sitting. Get back up again. And start trying to walk some more. Amen? Thanks, Mike. But the key is, is that every time you fall or make a mistake, when a baby falls, they don't just lay there and cry for weeks. 
It doesn't take a truckload full of other babies to come in, encourage them that they can get back up. Come on. They go back to sitting and see what God wants us to do every time we fail or make a mistake is go back to being seated in him, entering his rest. That builds us up, that encourages us, and then we stand back up again, we stand strong in God, we stand against the enemy, then we get back to our walk with God, and then eventually we can run our race. Come on, somebody give God a little bit of praise. You can enter the rest of God about your own spiritual growth. You're gonna see some things about that in just a minute. So we need to learn to live while seated. Now you notice that when I sit in this chair, all the weight goes off of me, and all the weight is now on the chair. Now, Christ is seated in heavenly places. Revelation talks about he who sat upon the throne. And the whole premise behind this being seated thing, if you've never heard this, is that under the Old Testament law, the law represented works, 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 works. And people had to try to live a holy life, but they were doing it without grace because the dispensation of grace had not kicked in yet. It's not that God never gave anybody favor, or he never gave anybody grace, but by and large, the law was given to prove to people that they couldn't keep it so they would know that they needed a savior. So there was all kinds of things, systems and things that went on, and there was a temple, had an outer court, an inner court, and the holy place. And the high priest met in the holy place with God, with the presence of God, once a year, and he went in to make confession and get forgiveness for all the sins of the people. And there were bells tied on the bottom of his robe and a rope around his waist. And the rope was kept outside by the people. And as long as he kept moving, they could hear the bells ring. And if the bells stopped, then they knew that he had done something to displease God and he probably fell over dead. He didn't keep some of the laws and he fell over dead. Now, the whole reason for that, I know it doesn't make much sense just talking about it, but the whole analogy here is that that old covenant system was totally a system of works. Works, 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 works. There was no chair in the holy place. There was no place for them to sit down. So it's very impressive to the Jew at that time who knew the word of God and understood that system that when Jesus died on the cross, and the Bible says he accomplished the forgiveness of our sins and the riddance of our guilt, he sat down at the hand, at the right hand of God. Finally, that's what Jesus meant when he said it's finished. Finally, that was finished, and then we start the amazing dispensation of grace that we live under now. And I share, this, this is just my way of sharing this, you know, sometimes people get all mixed up about grace. Grace is undeserved favor, but it's also the power of God coming to us to enable us to do what God wants us to do. You know, we don't live under the Ten Commandments as laws now, but God still does want us to do those ten things and others besides. Now, they're more like promises. If you walk with me and you walk in my presence and you have a right relationship with me, you shall not put any other gods before me. Not like, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. Now, under the new covenant, they become like, you won't murder, you won't steal, you will honor your father and mother. But one of those commandments is that we have to have rest. We have to have rest. Well, under the old system, they had one day a week that they needed to rest. Thank God we can live in rest now. God offers us a continual Sabbath rest that we can live in that supernatural rest of God all the time. We need to rest our bodies and one day a week is good, but it's not a legalistic thing now where you can't do this, you can't do that from six o'clock one day to six o'clock the next. Now God wants us to live in that supernatural rest. Now let me share something with you I just found out. Found it out from my own notes. I must have preached this sometime a long time ago. Forgot all about it and then got in my notes and I thought, man, that is really good. Wonder why I haven't said that more than once. Okay, now listen to this. In Genesis 1, 26 through 31, talks about like the, the final day of creation where God created Adam and Eve. Let's go there for a minute. Genesis 1, oh, you're gonna love this? 
Matter of fact, I could just say amen after this and go home and it would be worth you coming. Okay, Genesis 1, 26. And God said, let us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, make mankind in our image, after our likeness, and let them have complete authority over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, the tame beasts, and over all the earth, and over everything that creeps upon the earth. So if I'm Adam, I'm already thinking, I got a lot to take care of here. So God created man in his own image, in the image and the likeness of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful, multiply, and fill the whole earth. Wow, God, the earth is pretty big. How long do I have to do this? And subdue it using all its vast resources in the service of God and man and have dominion over the fish, the birds, and every living creature and everything that moves upon the earth. And God said, see, I've given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of the earth and every tree with seed in the fruit and you shall have them for food, and to all the animals on the earth, and to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the ground, to everything in which there is the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food, and it was so. Now, if I'm Adam, and maybe Adam wasn't like me, I don't know, but if I'm Adam, I'm thinking, man, I better get busy here. I mean the birds, the fish, the plants, the trees, the seeds, be fruitful, multiply, fill the whole earth. Man, I can't even imagine filling the garden, let alone the whole earth. I wonder when the grass needs to be mowed here. This is just, this is a lot going on. <laughs> now, I'm just playing with you, but I'm trying to make a point. You know that, I mean, he really did have a lot of responsibility. I mean, if you get right down to it, God gave Adam a lot of responsibility. I wonder how Adam felt when God told him to name all the animals. I mean, I don't have that many brain cells left in my life to do that. So I'm just saying that he could have been a little bit overwhelmed, but now watch. Here's the thing that I forgot that was in my notes that I obviously remembered at one time that now I have re-remembered. So on the sixth day, God created Adam and Eve. And chapter two, verse two, and on the seventh day, God ended his work with which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all of his work that he had done. Now, here's the thing that I saw. God showed me this. Adam was created on the sixth day, had a lot to do, maybe thought he needed to get to work, but Adam's first full day on the earth was a day of rest. That's better than your acting. You know why? Because yes, Adam was gonna to go to work, but God, there's a lesson here. You gotta get in the spirit to see this. God was trying to teach him that everything has to be done. Everything I want you to do, the whole call in your life, all the responsibility I'm giving you, raising your kids, making money, you being a good wife, being a good husband, all the things that you need to do. And then if you've got a ministry on top of it, you know, you gotta be an example to everybody in the whole world. You know, that's just like, you know. Whoa, God. But all of it had to be done from a position of rest. So first he said, I'm going to teach you how to rest. Then you can go to work. Come on, I like that. Adam was created on the sixth day, and his first full day here on the earth was a day of rest. My goodness, I about drove myself crazy trying to raise four kids. You know, none of them were alike. They all had different personalities. One of them was like me, and I really had a hard time with him because <laughs> I didn't know he was like me, and I thought he was just always challenging me and everything. One of them was so sloppy, and I had the, you are not going to leave in my house speech with her all the time. And then one of them was a real strong melancholy, and everything had to be perfect, and then one of them just he just wanted to have a good time. <laughs> he didn't care about nothing. You know, I, when he finally got out of school, I was happier than he was. I just thought, Ugh. yeah. Well, now he's the CEO of our ministry. <laughs> the guy, now listen, 
I mean, he had a really, really, really hard time in school. But he did, nobody knew back then that kids learn different ways. And he didn't really learn from books. He learned from hands on. And I, now the guy can fix anything. I mean, I don't care what goes wrong. He can come around and fix it. And I'm like, where did you learn that? He's like, I don't know. I just kind of know how to do it. And then the one daughter that was so sloppy, I mean, I don't even know how she found herself, <laughs> let alone everything she had to leave with. That girl now is like my assistant and she helps take care of me. So let me just tell you, your kids will change. And there's no point in you driving yourself crazy while they're in the process. If you think they do nutty things, just remember some of the things you used to do when you were their age. And here you are, you survived. If you pray for your kids and you raise them in the word of God, I don't care how crazy they act, eventually the Bible says, if you train them up in the way they should go, when they're old, they will not depart from it. Amen. Entering the rest of God. My, my, my. You know, we need to learn how to live the way that we begin our walk with God. So let's look at how we begin. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. How many are convinced that you need to study this thing about entering the rest of God and learn how to live more from that position of rest. Doesn't it sound great? Wow. Okay, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For it is by free grace, God's unmerited favor that you're saved, delivered from judgment and made a partaker of Christ's salvation through your faith. How were you saved? By grace, through faith. By grace, through faith. And that's the same way you live. By grace, through faith. How do we now keep the word of God? How do we walk in the word of God? How do we become what God wants us to become? By grace, through faith. God's grace is the power that we need. It's not just undeserved favor, but it's the power of God coming into our lives to enable us to do what he has asked us to do. Under the old covenant, they didn't have the kind of help that we get. They were told to do it. They failed. They had to make sacrifices. It was a constant system of works, 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 works. Thank God Jesus came as a perfect sacrifice. He fulfilled the law. He died in our place. He took our sin. He took our punishment. He took our guilt. And now the Bible says in Ephesians 2, 6, that we are seated in Christ. We are seated with God in Christ. And so if he's seated, I'm seated. If he died, I died. If he was raised, I was raised. If he's dead to sin, I'm dead to sin. There's so many scriptures I could take you to tonight, but the thing you gotta understand is we're in Christ, and he saw us in him before the foundation of the world. He knew every person that was ever gonna believe, and we're in him. So if I've got a dollar bill in a book, and the book gets burned up, the dollar bill gets burned up too. So that means that everything that happened to Christ, legally, maybe not experientially yet, but positionally and legally, it's mine by covenant with God. Now I'm learning to walk it out in my everyday life. The Bible says, for example, that we're dead to sin. Well, I can tell you, I don't always feel dead to sin. Sometimes I just feel like, yeah, I really would like to just slap you upside the head. I mean, I really would just love to smack you and I'd love to stay mad at you for the next hundred years and tell everybody what a jerk you are. But I know that that's not what God wants me to do now. So now I can either try to be good, and that don't work, because no matter how much you try, if you leave God out of the equation, you're gonna get worn out from your trying, you're gonna get frustrated, and God's gonna stand back and let you fail because he's not gonna let us do anything successfully without his help. But if I go to God and I say, you know what? I know that that's, I know that that's, really, that's not really what I want. I don't really want to stay mad. I don't really want to talk about them. That's what my flesh wants. But my new, my new man, the new person you've made me to be, I want to do what you want me to do. But God, I can't do it without you. I need grace. So what I'm doing, my faith is out. My faith is not out for me to be able to accomplish, but my faith is out to receive the grace of God to enable me to do what God wants me to do. Now God gets all the credit.
And I like to say it like this, and I hope this, you receive this well. You know, grace is not an excuse to live a sloppy life and get by with it. It's the power not to have to. Amen? Thank God we don't have to live a sinful life. Number one, because we've got a new heart we don't even want to. And if we'll learn to have a real intimate, tight relationship with God, then through that relationship with him, you see, if you're just going to church, going home, going to church, going home, reading a couple chapters every day so God don't get mad at you, praying 10 minutes, going to church, going home, fulfilling all the little rules and obligations that somebody's given you or you've set up for yourself, that's not relationship. But when you have deep, intimate, personal relationship with God, then through that relationship with God, more than anything, you want to please him. And if you just learn to go to him and ask him for the help, even when you fall down, he'll get you back. And then you go back to sitting because you say, I'm in relationship. God's not mad at me because I made a mistake. He already knew I was going to make this mistake before I knew I was going to make this mistake. And he's not mad at me. He loves me unconditionally so I can rest in him. Now I can get back up. I can stand again. I can walk again in God and I can run my race. But we've always got to go back to the sitting, 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 sitting. By grace are you saved through faith. And this salvation is not of yourselves. It's not of your own doing. It came not through your own striving, but it is a gift of God. Not because of works, not the fulfillment of the law's demands, lest any man should boast. It is not the result of what anyone can possibly do, so no one can pride himself in it or take glory to himself. Now, those of you that have received Christ as your Savior, I want you to think about the time in your life, if you can remember, a time. Some people are blessed to just know God all their life and they don't even really know when they came to that conclusion. They were raised in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord and it's, they've had faith since they were little. But most of us know a time in our life when it was like, I can't do this anymore. <laughs> I, I, can't, I can't live like this anymore. I can't carry this weight and this burden anymore. God, you've got to do something. Now, those of you that are here tonight and you have not yet received Christ as your Savior, you may even be a church member, but that doesn't mean that you're born again. The Bible doesn't say in order to enter heaven, you must go to church. It says you must be born again. And that means that you lean wholly and completely on God for your salvation. You trust him for the forgiveness of your sins. You trust him that when you sin and the guilty feelings come, that you don't have to bear that burden anymore because he bore that burden. And those of you here tonight that have not yet made that decision, you need to understand this verse. You don't have to go out and get good enough to be saved. You can't do that. You don't need to put it off until another time when you think you've got a few more things straightened out in your life. Tonight needs to be the night. And all you see, you can't do anything to receive salvation. Receive is not a doing word. Receive is a receiving word. And everything in our walk with God comes from and starts with a, it is done, not a you must do. You understand that? It starts with a, it is done. Jesus said, it is done. I've done it all for you. Now you believe my word and through your faith, my grace will come in and enable you to do what needs to be done. I, you know, I have changed so much. I mean, I tell Dave sometimes, I mean, that man must feel like he's been married to 20 women over the 48 years we've been married. Because I mean, I was just like pretty much a nutcase when we first got married. And I have changed so much. And yeah, I mean, I guess I could sit here and say, well, yeah, well, I did this and I did that and I did this. But you know what? The few little puny pitiful things that I did. I mean, we finally get to the point where we just say, it's God. It's just God. I mean, it's just God. But I had, to, I had to learn how to live seated. And if I went to a service and I heard a message about my mouth, and even if I prayed, okay, God, I know I can't do it on my own. Help me. And I get up the next morning and I'm meditating on the scriptures. Thought about them this morning, quoted them this morning. Oh, God, may the words of my mouth, meditation of my heart, be still on your side. 
Put a watcher in my mouth, O oh God, lest I sin against you with my tongue. I mean, you know, I know the word is the power. But that still doesn't guarantee me that I'm not going to make a mistake with my mouth that day. And when I do, I can go right back to sitting. Whoops. <laughs> See, sometimes you almost miss your seat. I can go right back to sitting. Okay, God, my heart was not to do that. I'm sorry. You know every word in my tongue that is still unuttered. I had a plan for holding this today, but maybe it works out better in your overall plan for me to see my weakness today. Maybe if I did too good, I'd get too proud. You know, the Bible teaches us that God consigns to all men a certain amount of weakness. And you know why? Because if we didn't have that, we would, it wouldn't take very long and we would not think we needed him. And more than anything, God wants us dependent on him. I'm sorry, but as long as you're in this earth, you are going to make mistakes. And the thing is, you go back to looking at your heart. If it wasn't your heart to do that, and you're truly sorry, and you're willing to turn away from it, that's all that you need to do. Now you put your faith out to receive the grace of God. You get back in your seat. You stand in God again. You stand against the enemy who tells you God's mad at you and you're this and you're that. And, you're this and, you're this and, this and then you keep walking your walk and running your race. And if you want to give the devil a nervous breakdown, that's the way to live. Amen. What, what good does it do every time you make a mistake to go into three days of guilt and condemnation and depression and saying all kinds of negative things about yourself? Listen, God's got too much for us to do for us to do that. We, the same way we were saved, that's the same way we need to live. I came to him as like, when you receive Christ, if it was even for a moment in your life, at that moment, you gave up. I can't do anything, God. It's got to be you. <laughs> if you can do anything, God, here I am. Take me just the way I am and make me what you want me to be. And that's the same way that God wants us to get up every day. You get up. I don't care if you've got your whole Bible underlined. <laughs> I, you, you can quote Psalms from memory and you still need God. You can have a degree from five Bible colleges and you still need God. You can have the biggest ministry in the world and you still need God. So every day you go to him and say, if you don't help me, I'm going to be the world's biggest mess today. Amen. If you had any idea how much I suffered with condemnation because I was sexually abused by my dad and somehow or another I internalized that and thought it was my fault. I mean, the... I felt guilty all the time. I didn't feel right if I didn't feel wrong. That was the only way that I knew to live was just, I just felt wrong. What's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? And I'm going to tell you the truth now. And you look at me when I tell you this, and I think you know me well enough. No, I'm pretty straightforward. I wouldn't say this if I didn't mean it. I don't mess with guilt and condemnation. Not probably if it comes against me, maybe two minutes. And I'm like, forget that, been there, done that. I'm not living like that. Amen. You know why? Because my guilt, which is my sacrifice, doesn't need to be added to the perfect sacrifice that Jesus made for me. The same way we're saved, not by your works, by faith, true grace. To enter the rest of God, there's only one way you can come into the rest of God, and that's to believe. So when we make a mistake, we believe that our sin's forgiven because we're sorry and we've repented, and then we act like we believe what we say we believe. We get up, we get back in kingdom work, we shake it off, we go on. Next time we make a mistake, we shake it off, we get up, we go on. And to be honest with you, sometimes the more mistakes you make, the more you fall in love with Jesus because you wonder how in the world could he continue to love somebody like me? And yet I know that I know that I know that he does.